Um, good afternoon. How's everybody? Good. Well, I am delighted to welcome everybody to the third panel of this amazing symposium, Confronting Racial Capitalism, the Black Radical Tradition and Cultures of Liberation. Um, the afternoon panel will be um, moderated by Christina Heatherton, who is immediately to my left, and she will introduce uh, this afternoon's guests. I just want to tell people who are new to the space this afternoon that if you want to tweet the conference, our hashtag is pound sign racial capitalism 14. And if you want to sign in to the Graduate Center guest um, uh, wireless, you can do so. Go to your settings on your phone, choose GC guest. Uh, put in your email, click agree, and you're in. You will never get an email from the GC in uh, response to you giving your email out. I would like to, uh, as I do ritually at the beginning of each of our convocations, thank our many sponsors who made these events possible. The Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, of which I am the director. My name is Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Uh, the uh, Neil Smith Visitorship at CPCP, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, the Department of History at NYU, the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU, the Committee on Globalization and Social Change here at the Grad Center, the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean at the Grad Center, the Graduate Center Advanced Research Collaborative, uh, the Africana Studies Certificate Program here at the Center, and uh, the Doctoral Program in Earth and Environmental Sciences as well as a, an unnamed or anonymous donor associated with UCLA. I am uh, very, very happy to um, uh, say just a word or two about the Neil Smith Visitorship. Uh, my colleague and good friend and comrade, Dr. Deborah Cowan, who's a professor at the University of Toronto, has endowed a, a fund at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, a center that was founded by the late Neil Smith in Neil's memory. And what its purpose is to do is to, as it were, bridge the gap or the divide, neither of which I actually believe in, between activism and academia, activism and academia by enabling some activists from somewhere out there in the world to take a sabbatical, have some time to think and regroup and refresh and spend some time here in New York where we will learn from each other. Our first two visitors are coming from Brazil from the uh, Landless Workers Movement, um, and I think they're due to arrive in January and will be with us for a year. Uh, we've just passed also the, the commemoration of Black Consciousness Day in Brazil, so all of the stars seem to be aligning, and uh, this event, the symposium for two days, is the kind of big launch um, to bring to people's consciousness the Neil Smith visitorship and to start us on the important and difficult discussions we have about what is to be done. So without further ado, Christina. Good afternoon. You guys are so good at doing that. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. It's, this is a total joy to be standing here before you. Um, as you've heard, this has been a long time in the making. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank the volunteers that have made this possible. Uh, so thank you to Zoe Hammer, Craig Gilmore, Lydia Pello Hobbs, Jack Norton, Dr. David Stein, Caitlin Noss, Tommy Wu, Deshanae Dozier, uh, Laurel Turbin, Ola Galal, Samantha Moore, Rocky Banu, and whoever else I forgot. Thank you very much for your help. Um, when we were planning the other day, the volunteers asked me um, at the start, is there anything we can do to help you, Christina? And I said, well, you know, this has been very emotional. Um, if I ever uh, become so overjoyed and overwhelmed that you see me weeping openly, just pretend not to notice. Mm -hmm. so, I'm gonna ask you all the same. Uh, when uh, Ruthie Jordan and I began conceiving this event over a year ago, um, and actually truthfully, each of us had been dreaming of such an event a long time before, uh, we had our own ideas about the kind of conversation we wanted to have and the kind of questions that we thought were urgent to ask at this moment. So it's been a surprise to us, uh, looking up a year later, to see not only did we get the people that we wanted in the room together, uh, but that um, people are also expressing a lot of excitement to be a part of this conversation. 
uh, in the very first 48 hours after this event was announced online, um, the digital announcement had, uh, um, had thousands of hits. Uh, so before it ever began, this was the most popular event the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics had ever put on, by, according to online measures. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, how many of you heard of this event on Facebook? Um, the announcement, as people have told me, has passed through a lot of circles of scholars, activists, organizers, not a few Angela Davis fans, not a few haters, but also a lot of friends, uh, many, many times over. I mention this because I want to take seriously the fact that we've hit on some kind of nerve. Uh, the conversation that we're trying to stage here is one that I think many people want to be a part of and one that I hope will have the means to continue after we conclude today. So my, introdu in my introductory are, are intended as a modest effort towards uh, imagining what that interest might be uh, and how it might help improve our comprehension of racial capitalism, internationalism, and permanent war. So uh, most, much of our motivation for this event was to think together things that have been imagined as separate. And what do I mean by this? Looking at the landscape of struggle around the world, it often appears that global movements for justice fall uneasily into two discrete camps. There are those that are avowedly anti-capitalist or anti-neoliberal, uh, particularly anti-austerity movements in places like Greece, Chile, Quebec, Portugal, and others. And there are also movements against racist state terror in places like Palestine, Rio de Janeiro, Syria, Ferguson, Missouri, right here in New York City. From where we sit in the US, it is often extraordinarily hard to imagine uh, these struggles, the self-professed struggles against austerity, capitalism, and neoliberalism, and those against racist state terror as easily converging. Their self-descriptions, their points of emphasis, the ways in which they locate power, uh, their analysis of change, they're often presented as quite different and often incompatible, and this is a problem. And this is obviously not to say that there's never interaction between these movements. Certainly, this room is full of people who have, shall we say, mixed affiliations. Um, still, our analysis seems to drag. Our conceptions are not keeping pace with the transformations around us. And I think we often forget that the onus is not on social movements to articulate their aims in ways that are comprehensible to analysts. Rather, it is our job as analysts to expand our capacities to comprehend the struggles before us. Part of the problem, if I may be, if I may be uh, so bold, is that I think we're often content with half-truths and half-explanations, uneasy and unsure sometime about where the rest of the explanation might lead. For example, we're often able to talk about race without class, imperialism without capitalism, transnationalism without internationalism. I've been struck, for example, about the ongoing discussion of the drug war uh, and the revived discussion of the brave journalism of Gary Webb um, and how this conversation still evades the bigger question of the legitimacy of US militarism. Who were the Sandinistas and why did the US want to crush them? In fact, who was Augusto Sandino? Um, how did he oppose US military intervention in the early 20th century? And why is it that when we think of the ongoing drug war, that we're not always also thinking of the long history of anti-imperialist resistance to US capital throughout the Americas? Race without class, imperialism without capitalism, transnationalism without internationalism, these are disarticulations abound. But I want to be clear that these are not merely misunderstandings or simply stubborn. And refusals that we can easily they are elegant for if we are poorly these questions it is no less than the su successful re result of deliberate political projects these di these these disarticulations are not only intentional they're at the very heart of counter-revolutionary strategy they are decidedly counter-revolutionary disarticulations but for those of us who are students of the people on this stage or at this conference, we understand how these forces must be understood together. That capitalism requires a violent production of difference, an ongoing and ceaselessly violent process, processes which are often hard to see. For as Cedric Robinson reminds us, these are processes hostile to the very exposition. 
As the last panel informed us, determining who has access to land, resources, food, and freedom, who is depicted as being qualified to have that access, let alone control, uh, is itself a process of warfare. Apart from tanks, militaries, weapons, we need to understand how these processes of meaning making are processes of permanent war. And as writers, thinkers, students, activists, research, dreamers, as conscious people in this world who are fighting this battle, we need to be equipped to fight on the terrain of ideas. I'm so pleased today to be joined by a panel of people who are models of how to do just that. From global visions of freedom rooting in, rooted in the history of the black freedom struggle through figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, Ella Baker, Eslanda Robeson, to their own work and struggles against apartheid in South Africa, the Israeli occupation of Palestine, state violence against black and brown youth in Chicago and beyond, these panelists force us to reckon with alternative liberatory visions of anti-racist internationalism. Both their work and their life work enable us to better understand the dynamic processes whereby people have theorized, dramatized, and challenged the racist and gendered social relations under capitalism and consequently develop new articulations of struggle. They enable us to historically and conceptually reconstitute what has been deliberately thought apart. So please allow me to introduce uh, the panelists in the order that they will speak. As you should all know, each of the panelists today could have an entire book written about them, so I apologize in advance that these are rather concise introductions, but I want to make sure we have time for their remarks and our discussion. Our first uh, panelist um, is joining us via Skype from Vancouver, Mr. Jack O'Dell. Jack O'Dell was born in Detroit and attended the public schools of that city. His activism began as a merchant seaman and active member of the National Maritime Union, CIO, during and after World War II, which took him to many parts of Asia, Africa, and Europe. During that time, his shipmates elected him to the National Maritime Union Labor School, a training ground for organizers. During the years of McCarthyism in the 1950s, he joined the waterfront section of the Communist Party and took an active part with other seamen in getting the Coast Guard's uh, screening program challenged and revised in federal court. In the 1960s, he ran SCLC's New York fundraising office. Later, he simultaneously directed the Southern States voter registration program that Dr. Martin Luther King established uh, in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In the wake of the 1976 Soweto uprising in South Africa, Reverend Jesse Jackson asked him to set up an international affairs department for Operation PUSH, um, and later the National Rainbow Coalition. In 1977, the National Board of Pacifica Radio, the oldest uh, listener-sponsored radio network in the United States, elected him its chair, a position he would hold for the next two decades. He and his fantastic wife, Jane Power, now live in Vancouver, British Columbia, and in recent years have been active as consultants to the Institute for Community Leadership, a Seattle-based youth leadership development organization. Uh, and he continues to mem uh, mentor activists and organizers um, everywhere. And in fact, I bring, I bring greetings from organizers uh, from Skid Row, Los Angeles, uh, who um, say that their interactions with Mr. Odell have transformed their lives. Barbara Ransby is an historian, writer, and longtime activist. She is a professor of African American studies, gender and women's studies, and history at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she directs the campus-wide social justice initiative and is the former chair of the gender and women's studies program. She previously served as intern vice provost for planning and programmings. Uh, she is also the author of the highly acclaimed biography which you should all read if you haven't already, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision. The book received eight national awards and a number of other recognitions, including the Outstanding Book Award from the Gustavus Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights in North America. Her most recent book is the fantastic uh, and prize-winning Eslanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. Her publications appear in numerous scholarly and popular, popular publications and lectures worldwide. She serves on several editorial boards, including uh, The Black Commentator and Race and Class. Um, in the summer of 2012, she became the second editor-in-chief of Souls, a critical journal of black politics, culture, and society. She has been deeply involved in many progressive political and community-based struggles and campaigns over the years and has been recognized with numerous awards for her community service and activism. And finally, Nikhil Palsing. Uh, Nikhil is a professor of social and cultural analysis and of history at NYU. He is also the director of graduate studies in social and cultural analysis 
His work appears in influential venues, including American Quarterly, Radical History Review, American Literary History and Social Text, where he's a member of the editorial collective. Uh, he is the author of the award-winning Black as a Country, Race and the Unfinished Struggle for Democracy, uh, and edited and wrote the introduction, which is, I think, one of my favorite things that's ever been written, to uh, Climbing Jacob's Ladder, the Black Freedom Movement writings of Jack O'Dell. He is currently completing uh, an amazing uh, new project called Exceptional Empire, Race and War in U.S. Globalism, which is forthcoming from Harvard. Um, in 2012, he participated in a delegation to Palestine with the U.S. campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel um, and has subsequently produced writings and analysis which have been really critical to that study. Finally, it'd be no understatement to say that this event would certainly not have come into fruition without his support and his patience. So please help me in welcoming um, all the panelists and Jack O'Dell who will begin. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. Well, you know, I mean, I mean I'm happy to be here in your audience. <laughs> I wish I could be there in person, uh, but um, that, but I want to thank uh, all of the organizers for making it possible to have this wonderful conference uh, dealing with our history and our future, our vision and our commitment. I've been asked to, to focus some comments on challenges and opportunities for anti-racist as I experienced them in the past and comment on the value in the present. As an introduction, as an introduction uh, I recall that a considerable section of the African-American community at the outset of World War II accepted our obligation as citizens to participate in the national effort of fascism. We as Americans are part of the world. However, we participated in that effort under the double V slogan, V for victory abroad and V for victory at home. The double V for the African-American community was the guide to our active participation in World War II, driven by recognition of the need to defeat it carried with it a determination of equal weight and commitment to defeat the system of racism at home. This was consistent with the four freedoms of the Atlantic Charter, adopted in 1941 by the leaders of the United States and Great Britain, respectfully Franklin D. Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill. We were also encouraged in by the fact that the new labor movement, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, had taken a no-strike pledge for the duration of the war, but also expressed a firm intention to organize the unorganized in the South after the war. With the end of World War II, our nation experienced two competing visions of the world. One was that the end of the war carried with it the vision of the century of the common man. This vision recognized that the struggle to end colonialism was inherent in the struggle to defeat fascism. The idea of the vision of the century of the common man expressed by President Roosevelt and Vice President Henry Wallace. The competing vision that the world was facing was the American century, a view promoted by Henry Luce of Time Magazine and a number of periodicals. These two views were competing and had a different meaning for the world as our experience over time since that has dramatically demonstrated. In the late uh, months of the 1940s, Burma, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Indonesia each included independence 
in that period. In the same decade, Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the Vietnamese people, announced the struggle for independence from France and sent a letter to President Truman accordingly, requesting that the United States sponsor his country within the system within the system of the UN, UN Trusteeship Council. In return, he offered that once Vietnam had attained independence, the United States would be given access to one of the most important seaports in Southeast Asia. The Truman administration rejected this appeal. The Vietnamese won their independence from France in 1954, which the recognized. By then, the United States had already been involved in a war in Korea, camouflaged as a police action in June 1950 through 1953. At the beginning of the 60s, the United Nations officially declared that the new decade be known as the decade for the abolition of colonialism. Needless to say, the civil rights movement activists were not unaware of declaration. As Lando Robeson, an anthropologist, was an honorary member of the fourth committee of the UN, known as the Decolonization Committee. She regularly wrote articles for the Pittsburgh Courier and other black newspapers throughout the country on UN subjects. Civil rights active, activists applied this vision in a number of ways, and I want to point that are, that are just chosen uh, um, as examples of this kind of activity that was quite widespread. Diane Nash Bevel, a freedom movement writer, freedom writer for Nashville and member of SNCC, went with a small group of Quaker women to North Vietnam at the invitation of the Vietnamese to take note of the destruction of their country by the United States in the early 60s. Women for a meaningful with, with Coretta Scott King, part of their uh, delegation, Swint sent a delegation to Geneva where President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev were meeting. Great Britain, the peace movement, for several years held an annual Easter march for nuclear disarmament, a march to the nuclear weapons lab at Aldermaston. The U.S. peace movement's annual spring mobilization, usually held in April, an American adaptation of what the British had done to protest the war mania. This event grew steadily each year during the 60s. In April 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King joined the annual peace demonstration a few days after delivering his historic Riverside Church speech, the full text of which was published in Freedom Ways magazine, the, the full text of the uh, published in Freedom Ways magazine also reached a, a French uh, audience and other anti-colonials through the regular exchange that we had uh, with the magazine Présence Africaine in Paris. The anti-war movement continued to grow and gather strength as the foreign policy accelerated this unjust war in Vietnam. Active participation included Women's Strike for Peace, the National Council, clergy and laity concern, the American Indian Movement, District 65 in New York, labor, and the Progressive National Baptist Convention, a, a, a predominantly black uh, organization of ministers from around the country. By 1969, an estimated 4 million people were engaged in the annual mobilization for peace as they began to, um, as they, I'm sorry. By 1969, an estimated 4 million people were engaged in this annual mobilization for people, peace, uh, and they marched in 1969 not only to Washington, but in the cities rather than in our own cities rather than coming to Washington. The 1970s was a, was a deep seated uh, a, a, a opportunity that arose for very important um, anti and pro-democracy demonstrations. This de developed in the 1970s um, 
And at the beginning of the decade, Jesse Jackson established Operation Push, People United to Serve Humanity, as a new element in the civil rights movement. And with a clearly defined foreign policy position, having established a foreign policy, a foreign affairs, international affairs department, the first among, among organizations. The growth of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, and particularly the June 1976 Soweto Township massacre of children demanding good education, added a new dimension to the struggles for an end to war. The struggle for peace and the struggle to abolish racism was joined in solidarity. The very effective divestment program of the National Council of Churches against apartheid was re developed. The now, the newly famed Congressional Black Caucus focused on stopping this the lucrative sale of the Krugerrand in South Africa in the United States. Among the Black Caucus activities in the mid 70s was the issuance of a manifesto calling attention to America's relations with the South African apartheid regime. The document was co-signed by several civil rights organizations who, which were represented on the our movement responded actively to the 1977 Portuguese Spring in Lisbon, which celebrated the end of fascism in Portugal and the independence of the former Portuguese colonies of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. A large delegation from the United States went to Lisbon to share this event and meet the representatives of the former colonial countries, as well as people from around the world. This movement was general Costa Gomes of Portugal was the new president. A decade later, we would learn how once again, the United States and apartheid South Africa collaborated this time in financing armed revolt against the governments of the new newly liberated nations, uh, Angola, uh, in Angola and, and, and the South African government supported, um, supported um, Mozambique. You see this, shaping of foreign policy around the effort to turn the clock back on, on the various liberation struggles in Africa. At the end of the decade of the 70s, the issue of the, of the Middle East and the Palestinians in, the US, in U.S. foreign policy uh, gained considerable momentum. In 1979, at the request of the Association of Uni Arab American University graduates, my wife Jane and I, a delegation of civil rights activists to visit Beirut, Lebanon, and meet with the PLO. This delegation included Susanna Cepeda, uh, co-chair of Sane Freeze, Reverend B.W. Smith from Buffalo of the National uh, Baptist Convention, and later president of the Progressive Baptist Convention, Tom Porter, chair of Black Studies Department at Ohio State University, Al Gaskins of the National Conference of Black Law, of Mrs. Jacqueline Jackson, the wife of President Bush, Joel Kugamas, Executive Director of the Pacific Radio Network, and several others. We met with Chairman Arafat and other pro and other PLO uh, officials in Beirut and visited Tyre and Sidon uh, in South Lebanon. On returning to the U.S., we arranged to meet with Ambassador with the UNM, the young, to share some of what we had learned about the situation of the Palestinian and the role of Henry Kissinger's current no-talk policy in perpetuating their flight. By the autumn of 1979, 350 ministers from many denominations attended a conference uh, on South Africa um, and, and the whole effort to isolate that uh, racist society had held it at the UN Church Center in New York. The meeting was co-chaired by Wyatt Walker, former chief of staff for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Akatini, the Director of International Affairs of the African National Conference. The central message of their commitment to support disinvestment from South Africa by churches and other groups. And the following year, participants in the entire annual convention of push in Chicago marched on the South African consulate in, on Michigan Avenue, demand, demanding that it be closed. The Congressional Black Caucus issued a manifesto also and later held hearings in the Middle East. The 1980s brought forth 
four developments of significance in our discussion of anti-war, anti-racist internationalism. In their order of occurrence, the Nation magazine tour of, of NATO countries of Western Europe in 1981, of which I was a member of that delegation, to observe the widespread protest against President Reagan's unilateral deployment of nuclear crews in Persian Europe, especially the European countries, in the European countries of Western Europe. The largest anti-war demonstration in the history of the United States, June 12, 1982 in New York, was organized in which 800,000 people Phil Sheep's Medal in Central Park. You all remember that? You don't. <laughs> 1982 in New York, people in Sheep's Meadow Central Park, while another 100,000 people were left outside um, and on the, on the, in the various avenues leading from the United Nations Center through up to Fifth Avenue. Uh, this was a historic uh, de demonstration uh, that uh, established that, the, that a large strata of the, of the people of the United States wanted peace and that uh, Reagan's uh, uh, precipitous actions that didn't even have support for, for most of the, uh, most of, of the people in, in, in Western Europe uh, was something that we were determined to oppose. The two presidential campaigns of Jesse Jackson in 1984 and 88 placed the issues of racism, war, and poverty front and center and, and international in scope as he, as he is a presidential candidate, visited both Cuba and Nicaragua and brought forward the in the platform committee of the Democratic Party. Women disarmament groups, the Catholic University, uh, in this, this, this trip that we made uh, to the, the uh, cities of, uh, to, the, to the countries of uh, Western, Western Europe, the NATO countries, uh, one of the, uh, comment that I wanted to call attention to, and that is uh, the Catholic uh, University of, uh, in Holland, when we visited there, um, one of the women said to us, the, Na the Nazis came in 1940 and left in 1945. The Americans came in 1945. When are you leaving? <laughs> the delegations of African-Americans from Chicago to the meeting of the Not Aligned Conference in Zimbabwe in 1987, one of those uh, very important uh, developments in terms of the commitment and, uh, and uh, growing understanding of the relationships in the world that were taking place. Uh, we had a very sizable delegation from uh, sh Chicago made of uh, many local businessmen, uh, people who helped finance uh, the, 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 the campaigns of Harold, in other words. The connectedness of these events in one decade represents a high water mark in the peace, justice, and anti-colonial movement's efforts to change the nation's foreign policy. And so we see that uh, there are many opportunities open that we that we open by virtue of our activity to guarantee that the justice and peace is able to go forward for in the last analysis that is the future of our country that is the future of the world peace is our common humanity's highest expression thank you very much Much, Mr. Odell. Barbara Ansby? How are you all doing this afternoon? Good, good, good. They didn't tell me when I said yes to this that I have to follow Jack Odell. Um, humbling. Okay, um, I want to thank again the organizers uh, of this wonderful event. It's been very uh, stimulating and inspiring in a lot of ways and, and thought-provoking. Uh, of course, Christina Heatherton and Jordan Camp, uh, Ruthie Gilmore, uh, 
um, and all the unnamed staff who helped to get us here and make sure we've uh, eaten and been taken care of. Uh, I'm really honored to be on this panel with Jack O'Dell uh, and Nikhil Singh. Um, I was uh, asked to talk about the past and the present. That is, my work on the past and some of my work in the present. Now, let me uh, say a little bit to begin um, about why I think this conversation on a black radical internationalism um, is so important at this historical juncture. Some of this has been said by other speakers, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, because black radical internationalism stands in juxtaposition to a new conservative black nationalism, which is patriarchal, pro-capitalist, and pro-militarist. Now by this, I don't mean the old school black nationalism. I don't mean a call for a separate black nation per se, but I mean the attempt to rally black people to American patriotism. Mm -hmm. Remember the scenes in 2008 um, at Obama's uh, inauguration. I had never seen so many black people waving so many American flags uh, in my life. It was totally unsettling. Um, but they were not waving those flags uh, the way uh, people did in the 1950s and 60s to really shame America about um, the hypocrisy of its policy vis-a-vis -vis pe people of color. But they were waving the flags as a certain symbol uh, of racial triumph. Um, now, I, now, fortunately, I think most people have sobered up since then. And if they were not uh, convinced that um, the current president was not going to deliver us to the promised land, I think most people um, are pretty convinced by now. Uh, I'm a historian, so I think we have to ask ourselves, what does this uh, tell us about racial capitalism at this moment? What, are the, what does it tell us about racial capitalism that the outward face of US empire today is a black face. We have more people in power and on the world stage and more black people in prison and in poverty than ever before. I could quote the uh, wonderfully eloquent uh, Ruthie Gilmore by saying a black man in the White House and more people, more black men than ever before uh, in the big house. But it is not only black bodies and black faces representing US empire, from Colin Powell seeing the, uh, being, selling the United Nations on the fact that weapons, the fact, in quotes, that weapons of mass destruction uh, were the reason for the U.S. invasion of Iraq, to Susan Rice, uh, when she was ambassador to the U.N., um, uh, insisting to an audience that uh, she quite proudly spent a great amount of her time, I'll quote her, we spent an enormous amount of time defending Israel's right to defend itself and defending its legitimacy throughout the UN system. And she saw this as a fine um, allocation of her time. That says a lot. But it is not only this. It is also the ways in which both racial and gender narratives are deployed in the service of war and empire. Back to the US invasion of Afghanistan, the narrative, of course, uh, was a part of the narrative was the justification uh, for that intervention was to save, uh, as one of our colleagues has said, brown women from brown men. Um, the backwardness and misogyny of the Taliban was the justification for UN intervention. And if we were confused about that, the um, Rawa, the Revolutionary Afghani Women's Alliance, spoke to this saying that Afghan women's freedom from the clutch of both fundamentalism and occupation and patriarchy um, is possible only through their own struggle. But again, we saw um, in the words of humanitarian hawks like Sarah Power um, that a bemoaning of the lack of US military intervention uh, in the genocide in Rwanda. Now, it's a complicated question, but I think most of us would agree that uh, the US military has never been a force for liberation and freedom anywhere. Most recently, I was actually at a community meeting in Chicago at the height of the mainstream media's publicity about the kidnapped Nigerian girls, uh, and people were actually insisting we needed to have boots on the ground to defeat Boko Haram and rescue our girls. Now, these arguments on the world stage remind me of the same kind of arguments that we hear in communities about the need for cops in prisons, that only cops in prisons can solve local problems, and only guns and drones can solve international ones, and this is a fundamental logic that we have to reject. The good news is that there is growing agitation, organization around racial capitalism, against the new black nationalism, 
and linking it very powerfully uh, to issues of race and gender, gender and sexuality. Now, back to the past. Um, the work we do today stands within a tradition. One, as Ruthie Gilmore rightly said, is constantly being made and remade. It is being made through the repression and reclamation of memory and through the recuperative process of excavating buried archives and stories. I can just say as an aside, uh, I was very happy to hear Francoise talk about gender uh, this morning. Women's stories are indeed there. They simply need to be excavated. What I also want to say is that gender and sexuality are variables in the male-centered narratives we recount even when women's bodies are not present. But where we look and what questions we ask are key, as is the case of Islanda Cardozo Good Robeson. Essie Robeson's story uh, is a story that largely has gone unnoticed in part uh, in the large tradition with male leaders, particularly her political contributions as well as her intellectual contributions have withered in the shadow of a larger than life partner. It is, I can't tell you how many times that I began discussions of my project on Eslanda Robeson um, only to be talking about Paul Robeson in less than two minutes. <laughs> so we are missing many stories because the women are literally overshadowed uh, by the men with whom they work, struggle, uh, and live. So why is Eslanda Robeson's uh, story important? Most people know her because of her marriage to Paul Robeson, but there is another story to tell. Eslanda Robeson visited colonial Africa in 1936 and 1946, and then again uh, to an independent Ghana in 1958. She did so without um, her husband. She went to the front lines of the Spanish Civil War in 1938 alongside Paul to take a stand against fascism. She traveled through Nazi Germany Uh, in um, to, um, to in 1945. She visited Mao's China a few months after the revolution in 1941. She stood up to defiantly um, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy's committee uh, in 1953. She wrote or co-wrote three books and visited over 50 countries in the course of her life. Other reasons I think her story is significant. Essie Robeson and Paul Robeson were unapologetically on the left and allied with the world communist movement during the Cold War. This was dangerous business. In some ways, they were both blacklisted in life and have been blacklisted in history. I see the telling of Essie Robeson's story as a recuperative process uh, to bring her back into the larger narrative of a black radical internationalist tradition. Also, the way in which Eslanda Robeson did her work in the world is important. She did not have the approach of saving the third world or bringing her skills um, and insights to people of Africa and other parts of what we now call the global south. Rather, she located her own intellectual roots in her connections with um, and in the learning situation she found herself in um, alongside Africans. For over 40 years, Essie Robeson navigated a complex marriage as she navigated the cities of Europe and the villages of Africa. Along the way, she saw history in the making. Emergent fascism, eroding colonialism, and embryonic socialism, and the disintegration of empires. Working over 20 years as a freelance journalist for the United as a United Nations correspondent and writer analyzing international affairs and domestic politics, she wrote literally hundreds of essays and articles and delivered hundreds more speeches and lectures throughout the US and the world. She was unapologetically on the left, rooted in a commitment to African people and concerned with the voice and plight of women. As I mentioned, the first place of Essie Robeson's internationalist awakening was with the African diaspora. It was 1932 in Paris. Uh, that is, her, her engagement with Africa uh, was, uh, came about through a circuitous route. She, was, she and Paul had been living in London from 1927 to 1939, and in 1932, um, their marriage was going through a difficult 
time. They managed to get back on track, but she'd actually gone to Paris to uh, seek evidence for, for a divorce. But while she was there, she found much more than the evidence she was looking for. Her escort, confidant, and constant companion that summer was a Dahomean activist, Kojo Tuvalu Hoinu. How many people have heard of him? Okay, it's always a small, a small number. Of course, Robin, you have. <laughs> um, Essie Robeson to a group of um, African writers, artists, and thinkers um, who were in Paris at that time. One was Habib Benglia. Um, Habib was uh, an a, a dancer and a performer um, from West French Sudan. And his dream was of a global black dance theater that would perform on both sides of the Atlantic. He was bold and irreverent, to say the least. He told Essie in one of her interviews with him, the only troubles Africa has are the sickness, the beasts, and the white man. And the white man is all three. <laughs> he says. Another woman um, who she met during her time was a lively Martinican um, writer, Paulette Nardal that some people um, may be familiar with. She also spent time with Ada Bricktop Smith. I'm reminded of the conversation yesterday with Tulani Davis about um, artists and uh, the role of artists in circuits of emancipation. Ada Bricktop Smith was a complicated uh, person, but she had a, a club in Montmartre, and she became a kind of confidant of Essie's that summer. So um, in a sense, from the time that, of this trip to Paris um, um, until the end of the decade, Aslanda was really on a journey to find her political uh, voice. Soon after, uh, she had this experience in Paris about which she wrote actually in um, Dorothy West's magazine, Challenge. She enrolled in the London School of Economics and there she met Jomo Kenyatta. She was actually the person that introduced Jomo Kenyatta to Paul Robeson. He was very influential in her thinking. Aslanda wrote about Kenyatta, she says, before I met Kenyatta, I was studying anthropology and Africa. However, Kenyatta brought it to life for me. He took me out of the textbook into African life itself, and of course made her want to travel there. In 1936, her physical journey to Africa began. And it was an ominous moment, of course. It was uh, 1936 and Italy had invaded Ethiopia, and this was the backdrop uh, to her first trip to Africa. She went for several months, she went uh, by ship to South Africa, uh, and then to Uganda. Uh, she had gone on this research trip at the urging of Zora Neale Hurston. This trip had a powerful impact on her. When she was in South Africa, she visited the famous Robinson Deep Mines. She went on a surreptitious visit one day when the overseer of the mine was not there. She actually descended into the mines and talked to and interviewed the miners. She met some of the future leaders of the South African Freedom Movement, leaders of the ANC. Um, Alfred uh, B. Zuma and uh, Z.K. Matthews. Z.K. Matthews, who would later be a part of the famous treason trial of 1956 with Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu. She was also able to attend a historic conference in 1936, the All African National Convention in Bloemfontein. This was in what was then Orange Free State. It was a historic gathering uh, of anti-colonial leaders from all over the country, uh, and she made a special point of meeting with a women's group that was a part of the conference and, and gathered great insights from that. So that's again part of that um, hidden transcript, if you will, a part of an archive that has, been, um, has not been unearthed. Um, we don't have a transcript of what happened at that meeting with the women, but we do have her recollection of that. And we know that women saw it important to talk specifically about uh, gender issues and the experiences of women um, in that context. Essie was very uh, inspired politically and intellectually about her exchanges in the dusty villages and ramshackle dwellings of Southern Africa. She was humbled by that experience. In a quote from her journal, she kept a very extensive diary during her time there. And again, rather than seeing herself as bringing um, knowledge from her, her studies, she really saw herself as a student of people engaged in struggle on the ground um, in Southern Africa. Big talk, challenging ideas, enthralling discussions. The, wall of our, the walls of our world moved outward and we caught a glimpse of things in the large. 
As I, as I sat and listened to these Africans, these so-called primitives, they made me feel humble and respectful. I blush with shame for the mental picture some of my fellow Negroes in America have about Africa and Africans." End quote. In 1946, she made her second trip to Sub-Saharan Africa, um, this time visiting the Congo, on what was a pretty precarious uh, journey. And there's her journal documents, uh, you know, sort of getting on very small airplanes and having to leave some of her belongings along the way because she was on smaller and um, more fragile aircraft as she um, went further and further uh, into the interior of the country. She did a number of interviews on that trip. One of the people she interviewed, interestingly, was Moise uh, Tashombe in 1946, who would later be, of course, implicated in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. She did not know that at the time, obviously, and maybe neither did he. Uh, but she was engaging and interacting with people um, who would be um, really important historical actors later. That same year, she published uh, a book called African Journey, which was the chronicle of her, her diaries on her 1936 uh, trip uh, a decade before. She dedicated that book to the brothers and sisters in her growing political family. You know who you are. So, um, <clears throat> so oh, I got my page, pages mixed up here. Great, okay. Um, so Aslanda Robeson began her internationalist work as a part of an African diaspora and very much grounded in the anti-colonial movement in Africa. But it didn't stop there. She particularly had close ties to um, Asian activists, Indian activists. In the late 1930s and early 40s, she met and befriended Jawaharlal Nehru and his sister um, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit. In the process, they became lifelong friends, in fact, in the 1930s, when um, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit's daughters were studying in the United States and their mother was in jail in India for her uh, anti-colonial activities, uh, they stayed at the Robesons' home on weekends and considered uh, Essie a surrogate parent. Essie developed a very personal relationship with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. They exchanged long and personal correspondence over many years. She mailed him a copy of Richard Wright's book, Native Son, and a report issued by the National Negro Congress. Essie's relationships were extensive, and I think in some ways her political, her political internationalism was really grounded in a network of relationships, uh, from Chetty and Janet Jagan in Guyana, um, to diplomats she had met in China, to activists she had met during the Spanish Civil War who became exiles um, in Mexico, to correspondence she maintained with Kwame Nkrumah. Women were prominent uh, in this group of correspondents. Her anti-colonial sentiments were mostly expressed through her writings and speeches, but she did participate in a number of organizations. She was, of course, on the, uh, eventually asked to join the Council um, on African Affairs, but two women's organizations, I think, are significant in terms of her sense uh, of connections with uh, women in the global south and third world. She joined uh, an organization, she's one of the founders actually of, of an organization called Sojourners for Truth and Justice in 1951. My colleague Eric McDuffie has written um, about that. Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, Louise Thompson Patterson. Is, Louise was here earlier. Um, I don't know if she's, Mary's here. So um, very much uh, still present. Um, Bea Richards and Carlotta Bass. And they expressed um, outrage and protest over instances of racism um, and sexism toward women in this country, but also solidarity with um, women in South Africa. Another organization she co-founded in 1961 with um, communist exile uh, Claudia Jones was the All African Women's Freedom Movement, founded in London um, at Unity House. Uh, and this was an attempt to bring women together around a radical pan-Africanist uh, vision. If anyone doubted the seriousness of uh, Essie Robeson's internationalist work, um, if observers did or have historians do, um, the fact that she had a, such an extensive FBI file and also was followed by the British internal security, um, the MI, MI5, which is the British internal security, MI6 is the, um, handles foreign relations, but since she was living in Britain at the time, she was followed by MI5 when she traveled through Africa. And I, I was going to read you an excerpt. I'll skip, skip over it. 
but one of the um, reports from the agent that was following her was you know, insisting that she was a very serious customer with very strong radical ideas. She dared to think that Africans should be ruled by their brethren. So this was her example of her um, strange and far-fetched ideas. Um, Eslanda Robeson uh, participated in um, a number of organizations, as I said, the 1958 um, All Africa People's Congress in Accra, Ghana, was a particular high point for her. Her friend Shirley Dr Graham Du Bois was there. Um, the two of them walked arm in arm into the first gathering of that convening uh, with Kwame Nkrumah. Patrice Lumumba was in the audience. So let me just um, shift to uh, my conclusion, which is to say I feel that Essie Robeson's story really is only the tip of the iceberg of um, not only women's stories, but the stories that help us get a handle on not only um, racial capitalism, but the ways in which gender and patriarchy are implicated in it. Um, I always think of biography, it's a very personal genre, and I always think of what can I take away, not just as a historian and a storyteller, uh, but also as an activist. What have I taken away from um, my research on Eslanda Robeson? Of course, history is not a blueprint, but Eslanda Robeson talked and wrote about struggles in places that others chose to ignore. And I have to remind us at this moment that we cannot forget um, Haiti, which has not been in the news as much as it should and should be very much on our minds. She rallied around unpopular struggles as a matter of principle, and we have to insist on not being bullied into silence around the issue of Palestine. She understood the connections between US oppression and anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism elsewhere in the world. And in that sense, we have to be concerned uh, about the shanty towns that still exist outside Johannesburg and the prisons with and without walls and the occupied communities here and elsewhere. Finally, for Eslanda, black was a political color, a color dividing the haves and have nots, the imperialists and the victims of imperialism, the bullies and the freedom fighters. Today, there are a number of activists carrying on in um, Essie Robeson's fine tradition. I think I was really um, struck by Ruthie uh, Gilmore's uh, insistence that, that the black radical international tradition is constantly being made and remade. So today, many of us who have made a commitment to speak out and organize around the issue of Palestine as a matter of principle um, are doing that and attempting to make and remake the black radical tradition uh, through expressions of solidarity. And that is determined not only by the fact that some of us have gone on delegations, but how we've gone. The delegation that I went on with Gina Dent, Angela Davis, and Rabab al duhadi and others um, in 2011 was explicitly looking at the connections between um, the United States as uh, um, having its origins in settler colonialism and Palestine and the reality of settler colonialism there, the occupation there and the occupation um, here. I also want to hold up the work of some amazing young people um, who have uh, really been doing the work of intersectional, ex intersectional politics, have been doing radical internationalist uh, work in ways that I find quite um, awe-inspiring. A number of young people just came back from um, Geneva, Switzerland, confronting the uh, uh, US government about its treatment of black and brown youth in communities of color from Ferguson to Chicago. Um, they were a part of something called the We Charge Genocide Delegation, and you can find out more about them on wechargegenocide.org. But they are not only um, standing up to racial capitalism, they are also standing up to US empire, to patriarchy and homophobia. One of the things that the Black Youth Project 100, one of the groups uh, involved, uh, says as its mantra is, we're ready, we're coming. And they're coming not only to confront capitalism, but again, patriarchy, homophobia, and to, con uh, to confront elitist and top-down form forms of undemocratic uh, leadership, which I think is something we also have to face up to if we're going to have the kind of liberatory movement that will sustain uh, a different kind of world. So thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Mikhail Passing. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I want to thank everyone um, very quickly. I'm mindful of the time. Thank you, Ruthie, Christina, Jordan. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's a little overwhelming and quite inspiring to be in a room with so many of my uh, intellectual idols and inspirations. Um, not the least of which is Jack O'Dell. And you can see why I had to interview Jack O'Dell for almost five years, because he has so much to recount. Um, and uh, the only thing that's worse than going after Jack O'Dell is going after Jack O'Dell and Barbara Ransby. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, frame my remarks today in terms of these three, these three kind of concepts, racial capitalism, internationalism, and permanent war. Um, and I, I, I'm going to be a little schematic, and I'm going to try to cut a little bit on the fly, because I'm mindful of the time, and I want us to have some, some chance to talk. Um, so I'm thinking today about the question of internationalism and transnationalism um, from a largely US standpoint, and in the context of, a, of the post-World War II period, as I tend to do in my work. Um, and, and as I will argue, this, is the, this period might be thought of as the proper conjuncture for a decisive reconfiguration of racial capitalism with which we are still contending. Uh, the post-World War II period is one in which the valences of internationalism shift as capitalist elites within the world's dominant nation states turn decisively away from nationalism while organized labor becomes embedded within national welfarist compacts hinged to the global expansion of dominant regions of capitalist power above all in the United States, but also Western Europe and Japan, and to an extent, even the Soviet Union, although that's more of a debatable point for us, perhaps. Um, it's interesting to consider that this period, uh, one marked by the first sustained, coordinated effort to manage racial capitalism on a global scale, is also the period in which racial capitalism decides to simply call itself capitalism. Um, put differently, to represent, it, to represent itself as global at this moment, the global hierarchies of wealth and power and politics that had been framed, legitimated, legalized, and institutionalized over several centuries as preeminently racial hierarchies were either recoded by other names, no longer talked about in polite company, in limited ways reformed, and of course also subject to an increasingly coherent mass-based radical challenge. From the standpoint of the dominant recoding, um, however, the discourse uh, changes in, in many different ways. Race development, for example, becomes simply development. Uh, Western civilization becomes simply civilization. The yellow peril becomes the red menace. Formal equality comes to mean scrubbing racial reference from law and language. And anti-racism becomes a forensics of exposure in which racism is reduced to a special category of offense and a wrong to be righted so that business as usual can proceed on a more secure basis. Um, this is really quite a quite stunning transformation, and I'm obviously condensing and telescoping here to be sure. I mean, just as an aside, as many of you, you, you might know this, this sort of anecdote um, uh, that Robert Vitalis has written about, um, the journal Foreign Affairs, which is the journal of record still in international relations in the United States, in some ways in the dominant capitalist world, um, was, was its precursor was the Journal of Race Development. So the Journal of Race Development changed its name to Foreign Affairs in 1922, which is also the moment of the Washington Naval Conference, which really establishes, according to Adam Tooze's recent work, the kind of basis for US global hegemony in the coming period. And we can see these different kinds of markers kind of going back through time. I mean, I'm thinking about the post-World War II period, but obviously th these kinds of transitions are layered and they don't happen all at once. But there's something going on in which uh, the, the unmarking of race as a category um, is, is important to this moment. Um, and, and I think we actually have to, have to try to grapple with that. Um, and, and many of us have, and, and many of us have written about this in different ways. But I think it still presents a conundrum for us, uh, one that tends to leave us in a kind of endless looping conversation in which we are forced to constantly rediscover what we already knew. Um, let us take the important example of the relationship between capitalism and slavery. Um, it is no coincidence that Eric Williams' 1944 text, 
inaugurates the period in some ways in which racial capitalism decides to simply call itself capitalism. Indeed, Williams clearly identified this very problem and as a result was subject to the entire weight of professional historiographical denunciation, refutation, and discrediting, a project that intentionally papered over the germinal idea with so many layers of dross that it became very difficult to recover. Um, and I don't seek to redeem Williams here. He needs no such redemption from me. Uh, but beneath the technical disputes about slavery, profits, and industrialization, or mechanical Marxist debates about wage labor and the mode of production, a new generation of historians recently heralded in the New York Times, which is not in any way meant to detract from the richness of their contribution, uh, has, arri has arrived back at Williams' central point. Um, and the point, as I take it, and here I remain uh, as ever indebted to Cedric Robinson's wonderful essay on Williams, which to echo a previous speaker, if you haven't read it, you, you should acquaint yourself with it. Um, one of many in the archive of rich occasional essays that Cedric Robinson has written throughout his own remarkable intellectual career, uh, that slavery became the, quote, convenient foil for the expansion of freedom, defined in limited and subordinating terms as market freedom and the wage contract, obscuring how capitalism fully, was fully indebted not only to the profits of slavery, but its infrastructures, and we might add, following Ruth, Ruthie Gilmore, its infrastructures of feeling, accounting, insurance, actuarial science, double entry bookkeeping, and incipient conceptions of human capital and biopolitical depreciation. Uh, Williams thus expressly sought to undermine liberal historicism that increasingly cast enduring racial inequalities as the vestiges of a prior era now embodied in the habits and dispositions of the black poor. And to show how assertions of progressivism on slavery, much like the racial progressivism of the 1940s and beyond, was becoming securely hinged to the legitimation and expansion of capitalist state powers and new racial orderings of exploitation and hierarchy. And I'm quoting Williams here, just so you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This is Williams. This does not invalidate the arguments for democracy, for freedom now, or for freedom after the war, any more than it invalidated the struggles against slavery. But mutatis mutandis, he continued, the arguments have a familiar ring. We have to be on our guard, not only against the old prejudices, but against the new, which are being constantly created. So the problem we face in arriving back at what we once knew is that we do so at a moment in which racial capitalism arguably has less and less need to conceal its true face anymore, and which facing multiple terminal crises is likely to be tempted again toward final solutions. At the very least, the promise of turning segmented race development into a generalized development is no longer even on offer, and the holism that capitalism once embraced against its communist challengers has now returned to a far more open avowal of partition, separatism, and racism once more. It bears saying in this context that there has never been a successful movement that has represented the dispossessed classes in their entirety and in the fullness of their heterogeneity. Though, uh, though the communism of the Third International sought the negation of capitalism, it did not seek the negation of racial capitalism, at least not in its full measure, and thus abdicated or remained at least ambivalent on a fundamental point. After World War II, the movements of the darker peoples, in turn, were largely tethered to the fortunes of the darker and soon-to-be poorer nations that were gradually forced to cede the international scale to the sovereignty of capital itself. Where these struggles were articulated with anti-racist struggles, a broader internationalism of peoples was broached, particularly around the Vietnam War and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, and perhaps today incipiently in the struggle for justice for Palestine. But the goals of radical movements remain largely limited by nationalist horizons, even as capitalism itself now fully transcended them. And I'm not saying the nation state's not important to capitalism, just to be clear. Um, 
Within the United States, the democratic upsurge of African Americans, which was part of this overall decolonizing imperative, similarly resulted not in the general democratization that its most far-seeing visionaries like Jack O'Dell and others sought, but new forms of racial bifurcation in which a limited diversification of the elite marked the outer limit rather than the non-racial extension of national welfareist and social democratic forms, and subsequently a sharp return to div divisive racialist themes in which the punishment of the poor, black, and migrant became a prelude to a more general neoliberal unraveling. The latter has produced a trajectory uh, in which dissimilarities of position among the urban working poor across the world, the vast majority of people on the planet, are gradually diminishing, though in a context in which the prior collapse of radical and labor internationalisms has left us wanting for strategic vision effective coordination and holistic imagination. Uh, what we are up against has also not stood still. The war for capitalism is still being fought. Um, that, that is the war for differential advantage and primitive accumulation, or what we might call ra relative and absolute surplus value. Uh, once fought in the name of imperialism, colonialism, and racialism, such terms became temporary liabilities but the project did not fundamentally change. Uh, how am I doing? Doing great. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, that was just a kind of a, a slick pause to obscure the gap in my paper. Just kidding. Okay. So, so the, broad, the broad project of American capitalism, I would argue, in some ways, has been to reduce to the greatest extent possible the space between money and decision. It is easy to see how violence becomes the primary modality or instrumentality of this reduction, and hence very close to money itself. That is not to say that the promise of this reduction, that is, the reduction of the space between money and decision, is not in some sense held out to all people, at smaller and smaller scales, of course. But it also means that those who seek to occupy or linger in this space in ways that disrupt the equation that is, those who seek the power of decision without money are to be dealt with severely. It also means that the history of the accumulation of money remains always closely intertwined with the private life of power understood as the command of others in racial, gendered, and sexualized terms. Put differently, we might say that the US throughout the post-war period, and for much longer, in fact, um, has attempted to establish military power as the permanent appendage of or supplement to the universalization of capitalist accumulation, exchange, and governance across the planet. Anti-communism was the rubric for this project in the three decades following World War II, and though it was presented as a defensive strategy to forestall the imperial designs of Soviet communism, it was in fact its own imperial program of positive expansion that is, the securing and development of capitalist property relations on ever more expanded scales. In this sense, American planners both knew and did not know, and still do not know in some ways, what they are fighting against in the course of expansion. That is, they didn't simply misconstrue the anti-colonial nationalism that sometimes took the name communism. They were also unwilling to risk the possibility that those parts of the world deemed essential for the functioning of the whole might pursue their own autonomous or self-directed paths of development, including capitalist paths that did not comport with the US model or variety of capitalism on offer. In this context, it is possible to further refine our understanding of American militarism as a, an economistic rather than strictly economic orientation integral to US capitalism, a recurrent projection of force and violence in the name of freedom and not only or even primarily in the name of security. In this way, we can also better understand, I think, how cl the classical antitheses of American freedom, that is slavery and savagery, have been retained as powerful pretexts and durable cultural templates for war making into the 21st century, 
ones limed or some t subtended by an illimitable source of infrahuman racial beings who are alternatively the objects of contempt and erasure or pity and salvation. Uh, so I want to linger briefly on the question of the relationship between race, war, or we might even say race, war, and police power. Um, for if capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it, as Ruthie uh, put it last night, um, then we might also say that war is the primary modality and instrument of its accomplishment. And when we look at inceptive liberal thinking about the establishment of government by consent, which of course is said to be the primary US gift to the world, um, we find that the theorization of the state of war within the state of nature plays a central role in thinking about how to establish all sorts of relations at a societal level up to the level of international relations um, that at once secure private property uh, but do so in terms of an international division of humanity. And I'm really thinking here back to, to the work of Locke primarily um, in the second treatise, which I'm sure many of you have read, in, in which really there are two moves, and, and one I think we're more familiar with, the move which, in, in which just war becomes the, the, mode of, um, the mode of land appropriation in the so-called terra nullius, but also in, in the redemption of so-called waste spaces, but also uh, wild spaces that are, uh, that are inhabited by men whom he says uh, we can never have any, uh, men who are, like, who are like animals who we can never have any peace or security. So that's the native question. Um, and that's the question of settlement via erasure and contempt and a kind of, a kind of violence that has been fundamentally re resistant to any kind of decolonization wherever it has occurred. Uh, but the second move within Locke is the move is the is the elaboration of what he call or, or what has been called war slavery doctrine, which is that the other the other thing that happens in the state the other aspect of what happens in the state of nature is that in a state of war that, that occurs in a state of nature it is acceptable to seize captives and instead of killing them enslave them. And so war slavery becomes a mechanism for imagining the possibility of a slavery that can exist kind of beneath the level of civil order. So of course Locke is writing the, 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 you know, the Constitution of the Carolinas and he's invested in the slave trade and he's helping to imagine schemes of, of, of settlement from, you know, from the British Isles, what will become the British Isles in Northern Ireland you know, to the Americas. Um, but I think that these two, these two dimensions of kind of slavery and settlement, and I think in, in thinking about them in terms of war, um, uh, need to always really be thought together. Okay, but, but they need to be understood in the separate trajectories that they end up having historically. Because the thing about slavery, in part at least, is that it is, it is a humanizing discourse. Um, it's a humanitarian discourse, in, in a sense. Um, instead of being killed, people are being captive, made captive and therefore also being brought into the purview of civilization and the possible future in which they can be um, somehow uh, redeemed even as, as sort of subordinated figures. Um, and I think that, that that's, the doc, that's the logic of racial slavery that then sort of wends its way through a kind of a, an American discourse that says we are, we are here to, for example, liberate the captives you know, from their, their various kinds of oppressors. Um, and it's, it's, it's a discourse of, con, uh, uh, of, of pity and salvation. But the other side of the, of the discourse of American war making has always been the discourse of, 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 of fighting savages which ultimately requires scorched earth and extermination. And they actually exist kind of papered together in certain kinds of ways, and they can be called upon in different ways um, when needed and as needed. So um, I think it's actually important uh, in this moment especially um, to, to bring back these conversations into, a, into the same frame and to remember that when we're, when we're talking about racial capitalism, um, we're, 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 we're not just talking about racial slavery, um, but we were never, when talking about racial slavery, just talking about slavery. We were also always talking about settlement because we were always, in some sense, talking about war. 
uh, and about the conjunction between race and war and the way in which war is the battlefront that runs through, as Foucault says, the entire edifice of what we think of as civil society. And really, there's a whole tradition um, in radical thinking for, for, for the, these ideas, you know, from Angela Davis, importantly, and Ruthie Gilmore in this room, uh, you know, all the way through the thinking of Foucault and Gramsci and, and others. Um, but I, but I, but I think um, I think that this has has some potential, at least analytically, for for helping us to to think about what we're dealing with in this in this contemporary moment, where the face of American power um, is is a is a is a face that is supposed to represent a kind of redemption of the a redemption from the stigma of slavery. Okay, um, American capitalism, and here I'm wrapping up in my final uh, couple of paragraphs. Uh, learned its chops on the frontier and in the slave market, as well as in the factory and the corporation. Its primitive modes of accumulation in the theft of land and compulsion to labor were renewed and contemporary by the Cold War's globalization of manifest destiny. Um, that moment when Truman's investment prospectus, as Dean Acheson called it, was infused with the moralism of a crusade and the vitalism of a civilizing mission. And that Cold War script has been scratched over and recopied many times uh, since then. For developing an optic adequate to understanding the post-war structuring of power in these terms, what Cedric Robinson has termed the black radical tradition remains a central touchstone, not out of any sort of romantic fidelity uh, or nostalgia, but because it attempted what to date stands as the fullest effort at sabotaging the twin engines of dishonor and dispossession that still drive the racial capitalist machine. Last paragraph, I promise. The long black freedom movement provided us with uh, the principal dialectical counterpoints to the wasteful and destructive American half century. It did so not only by vanquishing the criminal order of Jim Crow, but by illuminating the history of dehumanization embedded within modern political economy proposing an alternative ethics based upon compassion rather than fear in social interactions among heterogeneous people, and by demanding a departure from imperialist arrogance and colonial, colonial violence in the relationship of the United States to the non-European world. Among the most important intellectual legacies it bequeathed began with the vision of abolition democracy, a sharpening of politically productive antagonism between black aspirations for freedom and prevailing discourses of American freedom that time and again made peace with the opponents of those aspirations. As we broach these questions again in an age in which capitalism itself embraces an apocalyptic future for the many, the imperative to reach out, reconstruct, and reimagine the broadest and most generous future grows more and not less urgent in the spirit of acknowledging the generous and generative contributions of Cedric Robinson uh, these couple of days, uh, we might say that only confronting racial capitalism will do. Thank you. Well, now I have the extremely unenviable task of speaking after all three of them. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask a question, um, and uh, while I'm doing it, you can slowly move to the microphones and think about your own questions. Um, but I was really struck that... You still there? Hi, Jack. Um, I was really struck uh, by... Um, the fact that this discussion of anti-racist internationalism um, was one of not just interpretation but also rediscovery. Uh, I think all the panelists in one uh, way or another gestured to the fact that we're talking about histories that are occluded, blacklisted, or recoded uh, so that, as Nikhil said, we are often rediscovering what we already knew. Um, and I uh, was struck by the, the recodings that Nikhil was talking about, racial development being recoded as development, Western civilization as civilization, freedom as market freedom. Oh, he can't hear. Okay, hold that thought. <laughs> Jack, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to... Uh, 
I wanted to ask the panel if they could talk about a more contemporary recoding that I think is relevant to this conversation, and that's a recoding of capitalism itself as neoliberalism, which by many accounts often appears as something that uh, David Harvey invented and Naomi Klein seems to have discovered. I don't know if you know that you invented it, David, but that seems to be the consensus. Um, so I'm just curious if the panel uh, can comment on how this specific reinscription, I think often a, a kind of antiseptic uh, reinscription, not by you, David, by others, of capitalism as neoliberalism has impaired, slowed down, or reinterred this uh, history of anti-racist internationalism um, and the kind of uh, ideological production that it's produced. So that's my question. Jack, can you hear us here? <laughs> be like a backup group. Jack, did you hear the question? No, I, I didn't completely hear. I, I heard her say something. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have Nikhil and Barbara try to answer the question. And, and, <laughs> and like I said, if you have questions, you can go ahead and come forward. Um, sure, okay, all right. So everybody's thinking. So Jack, we're going to take some questions from the audience. So again, if you have questions, please raise your hands or come to the microphone. <laughs> Look, is the audience dodging my question too? Can you all just come to the mic? I know people are thinking about things. Um, so my question relates to food. I was thinking about what Francois was saying um, in the morning panel about um, what's happening right now with the promotion of monocultures as like a war on the poor. And so I've been thinking about permanent war and just in my own research looking at how food is so implicated in um, the expansion of racial capitalism and also um, military in interventions at all, as well. Um, so just wondering if you could address that a little bit. And it's also interesting because I, recently I heard a speaker who was sort of instrumental in bringing the Green Revolution um, to India and who I think is very much implicated in current um, efforts to um, support sort of GM crops and, and that whatnot in India. He said, the future belongs to nations with grains, not guns. And I was thinking, actually, it's grains and guns, because if you look at agriculture and military, these are two huge areas of uh, speculation <laughs> and, uh, and profit making. So I would just wonder, and also just in terms of like humanitarian interventions, whether military or you know, um, for saving um, people in the global south. So wondering if you could address that a little bit. Jack, were you able to hear that question? No, I didn't hear. OK, I'll try to rephrase it while the panel okay. tries to answer. Are you going to type it? Oh, oh. That's one of them. You raise um, a similar question uh, in the earlier panel. I thought you know, it was really um, an important intervention that Francoise made in talking about um, issues of environmental justice writ large, but embodied within that, um, I think, the politics of food and, and the right of people to survive. And I think of it in an urban um, context in that um, you know, the food justice, and we, we actually hosted Naomi Klein recently. <laughs> Uh, was was interesting, um, and I I actually think the new book has uh, some important things to say about this, but you know the movement around food justice in some ways has um, marginalized folks in 
urban contexts who are living under a certain kind of occupation which prevents the procurement of food in a very fundamental way. And I think we have to um, both expand in the way that you know, a number of people have argued around green economies and thinking of incorporating any kind of economic solution um, to any kind of green solution or green policies to um, economic justice demands in, in the communities that are uh, so direly affected. But also looking at the agency of people who are um, demanding access to food in communities like Chicago and Detroit, where um, you know, Sassi Assassin has this new book about expulsion, you know, that we think of surplus people, and surplus people um, you don't have to account for in a whole variety of ways. And I think the denial of access to not just healthy food, but any food um, is increasingly where we are in certain communities, and that that's um, criminalizing survival then when people um, make certain kinds of interventions in order to eat. And so it's not just a question of community gardens, which in some ways accompany gentrification in, in certain communities and becomes a very complex kind of political um, negotiation, but simply the access to, to food. And I think you know, increasingly it's useful to talk about the ways in which survival has been criminalized, uh, particularly in urban communities. Uh, yes, I... Jack. Oh yeah, yes. <clears throat> I, I think that, that I think that that's a very, very important observation. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, uh, projected in the Freedom Charter was uh, the idea of an out, uh, outlines of an economy of full employment as socially useful work. Um, this idea of of, uh, of, of food is an integral part of the larger question of what kind of democracy we see. I mean, obviously, we want people to be able to eat healthy food, just like we want them to be have education and health care uh, and, and live in an environment uh, free of, uh, of, of terror and homelessness. So it, it seems to me that these particularities are part of a larger whole that has to be constructed. And we must do. We have to work on the particularities, but at the same time, try to fashion a larger frame of reference in terms of the quality of life that we seek for all. I mean, I think that's the fundamental thing. That's the long-term uh, proposition that should guide our activity. I'm trying to think about how to answer these two immense questions in a kind of concise, helpful way. Um, you know, one of the things that I, um, I think this is a, a, this statistic is correct, I think the one I'm going to say, was I think that the U.S. Department of Defense, the Pentagon, is the world's single largest employer. I think it employs about 3.2 million people around the world. And we know that um, in all the planning that goes on now in the U.S. military, almost, I would say, 80% of it is articulated in terms of humanitarian projects. Um, disaster relief, uh, famine, uh, climate challenges of various kinds. Um, and, um, and, and, and a lot of the sort of, the sort of large-scale planning around that really is about what to do with civilian life, you know, because civilian life is itself a problem. Um, and, and in a manual that I read recently, um, the argument basically goes, uh, civilians will be competing for all the same supply routes um, and, and, and pathways to resources that the military will need to accomplish its mission. So, so just think about the kind of way that works, really. In order, to, in order to save civilians, in general, from these various calamities, civilians actually have to be either detained or sort of removed or sort of placed to the side so that the military can actually gobble up the kinds of resources it needs. And these are the kinds of visions that are, are sort of out there, right, as a kind of adjunct to disaster capitalism and, and, and to the kinds of crises that it's facing. And they go alongside with the, the they go along with the fantasies that among the very rich that, that and not just the very rich, that they will somehow be able to um, uh, produce a kind of vertical distance from all of this. You know, that they can just, they can continue to fly over, they can continue to have things 
brought into them in sort of safe safe zones. Um, and and to me, you know, that kind of that kind of mapping or that kind of effort to sort of think about the world we we live in right now is 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 really more useful and specific than say the invocation of a term like neoliberalism because clearly there's been a tremendous mutation in the way in which capitalist societies organize themselves you know and i think many people have written extremely helpfully about that um, i do think maybe what you were going for christina is the idea that to talk about neoliberalism somehow sort of just naturalizes this sort of idea that 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 all we ever have is a certain kind of horizon that we can really never think beyond, whereas at least in the argument about capitalism, which has always, to, to my mind, be, been informed by its dialectical opposition, the idea is that capitalism holds, holds the sort of seeds of its own undoing in some sense. It's not just this kind of project that is just kind of tinkered with all the time in various sorts of ways. So, um, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I find a lot useful in the literature on neoliberalism, but I don't, I don't necessarily think it's the, the most interesting way to talk about what Ruthie calls the anti-state state, or to, to sort of describe the kind of geographies of, um, the new geographies of partition, which actually have become much more supple and flexible and, and, um, and, and movable um, in, the current, in the current moment. Um, and, and all of this sort of begs to me the most important question, which is I think what I was trying to gesture at to some degree in my remarks, which is you know, how, do we, how do we think about the scaling up of our own oppositional projects once more. And I'm tremendously struck by, by Barbara's remarks and especially Jack's remarks at just the depth um, and the density of movements um, aware of the international scale and thinking through uh, how to articulate uh, struggles against militarism, struggles against colonialism, and struggles against racism in the preceding period. And, we, we don't seem to have that kind of density or that kind of ambition um, in, our own, in our own sphere of activity right now. And I think that's what we, we, need, to be, we, we need to be thinking about how to, how to redevelop. And we'll always be redeveloping. We'll always be reinventing our tradition. And so that's not the problem. Um, but we have to do it. I'll defer. To, I actually have a question to raise, but I see there are two people at the mic. But so I'll incorporate my question into a response. To okay. Well, um, thank you so much for all your presentations. You know, uh, they were fantastic. Um, the questions about kind of liberalism and racial capitalism and internationalism, because in each of your papers, you know, with Jack's comments and with McKeel's, you take on um, the ways in which, particularly the Truman administration you know, inaugurates this kind of era of permanent war. And in Barbara's comments, you know, she talks about the challenges of a black radical internationalist tradition in the age of Obama, the kind of celebratory nationalism that we've seen. So if you could think about the kind of out loud with us, the challenges and opportunities of internationalism in reckoning with liberalism on one hand, uh, in the face of this resurgent kind of revanchist right wing block that has won these elections uh, in recent weeks and help us think through uh, how we might confront, you know, this nexus in the current um, conjuncture. I also wanted to echo uh, the excellent uh, remarks. I believe the, the question that I have is for uh, Nikhil and it speaks to, I think, a fundamental issue for me and that is how you confront uh, racial capitalism when it seems that much of our political language, particularly those of us who are stuck in the Western Academy, mm -hmm. stems from a lot of the theoretical contributions of a, of a John Locke, of uh, a Thomas Hobbes, of these people who not are only responsible uh, for the development of modern society, but their work actually sets the premise um, for modernity itself. So how do we confront racial capitalism when it seems our kind of our political language, the tools that we use um, in the academy seems to be compromised. Poets in the room. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I do have kind of a response to, to both of those. I directed it toward Nikhil, and I'm sure he'll have a 
really deep answer in a minute. But, um, you know, I was thinking as uh, Jordan was asking his question, what are the sites of struggle at this juncture? And two things that I've been wrestling with, um, and, and it represents a very ambivalent shift in my own political uh, practice, um, is taking electoral politics a little bit more seriously than I have in the past, and, and particularly on the local level. We almost had um, a very progressive mayoral candidate in Chicago who I had said I would work with, and I've actually never done that before. It was Karen Lewis, the head of the fierce and fighting Chicago Teachers Union that led um, an amazing strike uh, recently and was poised to use a campaign as a strategy for movement building. Um, so that's, that's one thing, so place hold that. The other is really thinking more seriously about the work we do in the academy. I think um, for many years I saw my political life as wholly outside of, and I, you know, the less my employer knew about my political activity, the better. Um, and, and I'm still quite ambivalent about how to negotiate that, and a, a group of us are rereading Fred Moten's um, uh, article about the undercommons, the article that led to book about the undercommons and really wondering how do we understand the role that universities play today, particularly in promoting and defending racial capitalism. And Ruthie has written about this a little bit, the diversity industry, the multiculturalism industry, that in a sense it sounds like the opening up of the university, it feels like the a concession to the demands for inclusion, but their inclusion on certain terms, uh, going to the brother's point about language, that, in, that you have to speak a certain language and you have to operate within a certain logic in order to A, get in, and B, stay in, and not be totally out of your mind, but sometimes stay in and be out of your mind. Um, but, but to really look more seriously at the um, sustaining and validating and cover work that happens within universities, and particularly within the departments that many of us who see ourselves as radical occupy, the interdisciplinary departments that people fought um, to, to, to um, come into the university. And Cedric was interviewed uh, not long ago talking about black studies and the evolution of black studies away from um, sites of struggle and connection to struggle, but also now really being places where um, we don't recognize the stories that are told, we don't understand the theories that are formulated, and dare one um, be uncivil, as my um, would-be colleague Stephen Salida was in, in tweeting about Palestine, he was, he was tweeting as Palestinian, and was basically denied his job because he stepped out of a certain kind of civil discourse, not even on campus, that is in his... Um, public life in his civic life away from his job, um, he tweeted things that the university deemed anti-Israeli and uncivil, and that became the language for excluding him from the academy. So anyway, um, I'm just raising, that's my question response, that here we are in an academic setting. Um, I've always had this uh, healthy or unhealthy ambivalence about my life in the academy, and really no more so than, than these days. But I would be interested to hear what other people also think about how to reconcile that contradiction. Do we, can we only be criminal in the academy, which is how Fred Moten starts that particular article that I'm thinking of. Can we only steal to uh, and become a, a sort of, you know, um, community of, of, of refugees in a way uh, to, to do the work that is to be of and, you know, be in and not of. So I raise that as I think a really important question. It's the site where a lot of um, the language and data is generated that supports and, and dresses up and gives a facelift to racial capitalism in some of its most brutal forms, I'm, I'm sad to say. Um, and how are we complicit in that? Does Jack, can Jack hear us? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can? Okay. I didn't know if these were working or... <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I think we all always have to search out um, and listen for the language that, that people use every day to express their uh, problems and situation they are uh, uh, and are going through. 
and on the basis of the use, of, that's one of the great advantages of listening well. You know, you can talk well, but you got to learn to listen well too. Because when we listen well, we, we see how the, the way in which people are expressing their concerns that are the concerns that we have also. And I think that, that basically uh, this, this idea of creating the language uh, that is the most easy for most people in their experiences to understand. However scientific we might be, we have to break it down, so to speak, in such a way that people that people understand what we're saying and therefore are making their input because their input is as valuable in the creating of the of the ideas that we want to put forward their their input into it based upon the way they put it is an important ingredient uh, we we create science out of being able to listen well and interpret that which we have heard so that it touches people say oh that's exactly what i mean and that's exactly what i mean <laughs> I, I know we're, 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 at, we're sort of at time almost, but I'll just say one, one last brief thing, which is, um, yeah, I think these are, these are very important questions, and I think we wrestle with them every day, and those of us in universities who are, I think, consumed at a certain stage of our career with um, administering the university and kind of... Um, helping it to continue to go and or have our time and our souls just kind of sucked up by that, that kind of activity, um, have a, have a, you know, or confronting something specific about the neoliberal moment, which is really part of how it works is just by keeping us too busy to do anything, you know, to do, to actually take the time, to take back time, to take back the time that we actually need to have long discussions about things and to, um, to really linger and, and listen, as Jack's saying, um, and to learn what we need to learn or to relearn what we, what we already knew. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a really, really challenging thing. And, I, and since I moved back to New York from Seattle, I know I found that to be uh, really quite dramatic. I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm always being time managed and I'm always time managing others. You know, okay, I've got, you know, I've got 10 minutes, you know, I'm time managing right now, right? I've got to, um, and it's and it's a and it's a kind of it's a kind of uh, it's a it's a it's a real challenge uh, that I think we we have to we have to think about very seriously how how we take back the time that we need to do this work and and give ourselves the time and give ourselves permission to to take the time. Um, in terms of the, the the university, you know, I think the university. I don't think we have to just be criminals. I think, I mean, in Fred's terms, I think, I think we can we can do what we all try to do is to make the boundaries of the, these institutions, which are becoming more fixed and more uh, impenetrable, um, more porous, more available, more leaky. Um, think about how to redirect them, um, reimagine the spaces we inhabit as sites of linkage and sites of solidarity. And I think all of us try to do those kinds of work. These are, these are some of the spaces we have that are really quite vital in this moment. I mean, the Grad Center, I meant to say at the beginning, I mean, it's, it's just such a key institution of our city um, and a place where we can do this work. And if we really start doing it work w well, you know, and, and, and having the impacts that we want to have, we will have more pressure coming down on us. We'll have more hell raining down on us. Of course we will. But that, that's what we want, ultimately. You know, that's where we want to go. And in terms of, um, you know, the, the master's tools and the master's house, I mean, I, I think there's much to the argument that the master's tools can't dismantle the master's house. But I will say they sure can help. So on uh, the uh, last point about time is probably a good place to end. Um, but I do want to add that, as Danny Widener said earlier, time, winning time for spaces of leisure, for spaces of thought, for spaces of organization has been a victory of working class movements. And our lack of time, you know, time needs to be a site of struggle for the present and the future. We appreciate all of you taking your time this Friday afternoon to be a part of this conversation. We hope that you will join us for the final plenary of Confronting Racial Capitalism, which will happen tonight at 6.30 uh, at the NYU Global Center, which is located at 238 Thompson Street. It'll be at the C95 Lecture Hall. It's on the program. Please take a program if you haven't already. 
Um, please join me in thanking the panelists and thank you for being one of you. Bye, Jack. Bye, bye, Jack. Can everybody say bye, Jack? Bye, Jack. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Jack. Thanks so much, Jack. That was fantastic. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it very much. I thank you for we'll inviting me. We'll be in touch me. soon, okay? We'll and be talking soon. Thanks to Jane and thanks to Karen.